Hey guys, what's up? It's Curtis here with Long Trend. Look, I'm a CFA charter holder and web developer, and it's my job to help investors uncover quality stocks by showing them how I analyze and pick companies using the web-based tools that I've created. Each week, I'm going to work through a stock and try and determine if I'd be interested in buying that stock at today's price. Now, you should be aware that I would not call myself a pure value or growth investor, but I would say that I really am only interested in quality stocks that make money now. So you won't find me looking at pre-cash flow stocks in this channel unless there is an obvious clear path to profitability. So for the first week, I'm going to select an easy one, a company that really needs no introduction, Procter & Gamble or P&G on the New York Stock Exchange. P&G is a $340 billion stock and they sell their products virtually everywhere on earth. Incorporated over 100 years ago and paying a dividend ever since, Procter & Gamble is one of the most consistently profitable and cash generative companies you could find. So with a diverse portfolio of many widely known consumer products, Gain, Gillette, Mr. Clean, and Bounty, just to name a few, Procter & Gamble has a large portfolio of intangible assets, namely brand names that helps create a moat around the company that is hard for competitors to crack. So all right, with that intro, let's open the model and get started. Okay, so here we are at longtrend.com slash models. I'm going to search the table for Procter & Gamble. You can do so by either the ticker or the name. So type in PG. There it is. I'm going to click on the web model model link to Procter & Gamble's model. But before I do so, I want to say that I also have a link to the most recent 10K. Find that handy to have. I have a link to Excel data that I have. I have any link to any analysis that I do, uh, YouTube or otherwise. And then um, I have a link to the web model. So I'm going to click into this. And that will bring you to Procter & Gamble's web model. So I want to orient the viewer on how this model is structured. There's, there's a few sections. So the top section is enterprise value. The second section is operating assumptions. The third section is free cash flow. So I use the operating assumptions to calculate the free cash flow. The next section is sources and uses. What I'm interested in here is the sources and uses of cash. Are they issuing a lot of debt? Are they buying back stock? What's their dividend look like? Is their dividend covered? That's what I'm interested in. Okay, so Procter & Gamble is a $341 billion market cap company, but they're a $364 billion enterprise value company. I like to look at enterprise value because that's the total value of the business. If an acquirer was to come and buy Procter & Gamble, they'd have to buy the, the enterprise value of the business. So that means they'd have to buy all the stock, which is the value of the market cap. Then they have to take out all the debt, and then you subtract the cash from that, and you get the total value of the business. Directly below enterprise value, you can see I calculate an enterprise price value to EBITDA multiple. Procter & Gamble right now is trading at a 17.8 EV to EBITDA multiple. Historically, over a 10-year period, they were at 15 and a half times, 16.4 times. The three-year average is 17.4 times. At the end of the last fiscal year, they're at 18 times. So it has gone up over time. But in this market, 17.8 times isn't that bad for Procter & Gamble. It really hasn't run up like some other names that we've seen on a multiple basis. So for Procter & Gamble, what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use their three-year enterprise value EBITDA multiple of 17.4 as an exit multiple in 2031. That's gonna equate to an enterprise value based on growth in EBITDA and, mar and revenue of 554 billion. The next major set of assumptions are revenue growth and EBITDA margin. So over the last 10, five, three, and one years respectively, Procter & Gamble has not grown over a 10-year period, but they have grown over a five, three, and one year period. So what I'm going to use, I know it's historics, but it's not a bad start when you're looking at any companies. I'm going to use the three-year growth rate for Procter & Gamble. Now, Procter & Gamble is also a particularly stable business, so it's a bit easier to use a historic growth rate as, as a starting point in any modeling exercise. However, I, I will note that this model is meant to be flexed, right? If, if you don't want to use a three-year rate, you can actually just swap it to a different rate here. So you can click right in the model. So I just, for example, click to a five-year rate, and that recalculates calculates revenue and actually flows through and recalculates the expected return. For this demonstration, I'm going to go back to the three-year. So I'm going to assume that Procter & Gamble grows over the next 10 years at 4.4%. And in 2031, they'll have revenue of $120 billion. Right now, they have $77 billion in revenue. Procter & Gamble has a 25 to 27% EBITDA margin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to also assume a three-year average of their EBITDA margin of 26.6%. And then what the model will do is it will interpolate up to that exit EBITDA margin that you assume over here of 26.8%. Next up, there's a few other assumptions, depreciation, share-based comp, CapEx, current in income and deferred income tax expense, interest expense and interest income. These are largely driven off of either EBITDA or revenue or for 
interest, it's either cash or debt. Okay, so once I have those operating assumptions calculated, I can actually move down to the free cash flow section and calculate free cash flow, which is really what I'm after when I'm doing a expected return analysis. So when I'm looking at Procter & Gamble's free cash flow line, it's obvious to me that this company makes a lot of money. If I look historically, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, 12 billion, 14 billion, 16 billion. I mean, this is not surprising given the size of this company, the market cap of this company, and the history of this company. So the cash that Procter & Gamble generates is a good thing. The question is then, what does it use that cash for? And how are those commitments sized relative to the cash it's currently generating? So that's where the sources and uses section comes in. What I do next is I look through the dividend history, if they pay a dividend, the share repurchase history, if they're buying back stock, any acquisitions, and then anything else, but there's generally not a whole lot other than those buckets. Then I like to look at, does the company need to fund these activities with debt, or do they have the free cash flow on hand to meet these commitments? So if you look at Procter & Gamble's commitments, they've been growing their dividend over a 10, 5, 3, and 1 year period at 5, 4, 5, and 7% respectively. Not a crazy fast dividend grower, but not bad. More importantly, the dividend coverage is there. So if I look at their free cash flow over the last trailing 12 months, they've generated $15 billion of free cash. They paid $8.4 billion, 1.8 to 2x coverage of their dividend. That's good to see. So what do they do with the rest of their cash? Well, they buy back a lot of stock. So over the last 10 years, they bought back about 4 billion of stock. Over the last five years, it was 5 billion. Last three years, it was almost 5.5 billion. And last year, they did almost 10 billion. So that's a good thing to see. I mean, this is completely discretionary. They can stop this tomorrow if they wanted to. They, they won't want to because they have the cash to do it, but they could. And that's important. They've been spending about a billion a year on average on acquisitions. So I'll put that in the model because that actually propels their growth. So if I'm also expecting them to grow at 4.4%, some of that might be related to the acquisition spend. And then they don't do much else. So that's basically a reconciliation of the free cash flow that they generate. Anything left over, I can see that what they're going to be able to do is put that onto the balance sheet. So the negative number here, cash and investments to slash from the balance sheet, that's actually putting cash onto the balance sheet. So if I scroll up to the cash line here, I will see that under this forecast, their cash balance is going to grow 11, 12, 13, 15, 17. So that's a good thing. So they're able to continue to grow their dividend at 5% a year. That's what I've put in the model. It's a three-year average. They're able to continue to buy back stock for about $5.5 billion a year. They can acquire some things if they want to, which is in line with historical rates. And they're actually going to be able to put cash on the balance sheet. Okay, so now it's time to translate this all into a return that you can get as a shareholder for you to buy Procter & Gamble stock today. So that's what this expected return section at the bottom of the model is calculating. So this calculation is an internal rate of return calculation. And what it actually calculates is the return to the shareholder if they were to buy the stock today and hold it for the 10 year period. It also includes the dividends you're gonna receive along the way and the expected share price that you'd be able to sell Procter & Gamble for in the future if everything in the model actually comes true. So the growth rate of revenue, the EBITDA margin, the EBITDA multiple, Etc. So if those assumptions do come true over the next 10 years, if you were to buy Procter & Gamble today at $141 a share, you'd hold it for 10 years. The dividend would grow to $550 a share, which is not bad. You'd be able to sell the stock for about $260, bucks, and that would work out to a compounded rate of return for that holding period of about 8.8%. Pretty decent for a company of the quality and size and diversity in the asset portfolio of, as Procter & Gamble. Okay, so before we conclude on that 8.8% IRR number, it's always a good idea to stress test the assumptions in the model to come up with a range of expected returns. And I always like to do it to the downside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three adjustments. The first is I'm going to change enterprise value to EBITDA to 15.5x by moving this to 10 years. Next, I'm gonna say revenue growth is flat. Actually, it's gonna be zero. So I'm gonna plug zero, 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 and zero. So that's gonna interpolate to zero all the way along. And last but not least, I'm gonna move their EBITDA margin to 24.4%, which is the lowest that it's been over the 10 year period. So let's move that to 10 years. And I can see that the 8.8% turned into a 1.9% expected return. So to me, by buying the stock today, the downside is about 2% expected return over a 10 year period. Admittedly, no one wants to earn 2% on any investment, although it's nice to know that that's sort of a calculated downside to this investment. Now, of course, anything could go wrong. Maybe the cost structure of Procter & Gamble across their more, most profitable portfolio of assets goes too high, or maybe there's some foreign exchange risk that they don't 
hedge that causes some deterioration in their business model. But I, I think that over a 10-year period, if the downside's 1.9, the upside's 8.8, and maybe they do even better than 8.8, it's not a bad hold. It, it, it could be part of, of a balanced portfolio of blue chip stocks for sure. Okay, guys, that's it for Procter & Gamble this week. If you liked what you saw here, please make sure to hit that like button and hit the subscribe as well. I'm going to do my best to post a video at least once a week to analyze a different stock, and I hope you'll stick around with me. All right, thanks.